Hello out there and welcome to episode 135 of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast, Understanding Pressure Ulcer Stages. The Nursing Home Abuse Podcast is dedicated to providing news and information for families whose loved ones have been injured in a nursing home. Here are your hosts, Georgia Attorneys Rob Schink and Will Smith. Hello out there and welcome back to the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. My name is Rob Schenk and I will be your host for this episode. We're going to be talking about uh, pressure ulcers, diagnosing pressure ulcers, the different stages that pressure ulcers go through, um, and some of the some of the methods in which we diagnose and treat pressure ulcers. Um, and the reason why I wanted to have an episode talking about pressure ulcers at this time is because every year there is what is called Pressure Ulcer Awareness Day. And Pressure Ulcer Awareness Day, if I'm not incorrect and looking at my calendar, is going to be November 21st. So that's why I feel, feel like this this topic is is timely. So I just want to bring awareness of the issue of pressure injuries, um, particularly in the nursing home setting. Um, but we're not going to do that alone on this episode. It's not just going to be me. We are going to have a special guest, and that guest is Martha Kelso. And for longtime listeners of this ep- of this podcast, you'll know that Martha Kelso was our guest on the same topic back on episode 118, where we talked about prevention of nursing. I'm sorry, prevention of pressure ulcers in nursing homes. So we're welcoming welcoming Martha back this week. But for those that missed that episode, we're going to talk a little bit about her so that you understand where she's coming from. Martha Kelso is the founder and chief executive officer of Wound Care Plus. As a visionary and entrepreneur in the field of mobile medicine, she has operated mobile wound care practices nationwide for many, many years. She enjoys educating on the art and science of wound healing and how practical solutions apply to healthcare professionals today. Kelso enjoys being a positive change in healthcare, impacting clients suffering from wounds and skin issues of all kinds. Kelso's desire to make healthcare a better place for consumers motivated her desire to form and found Wound Care Plus. In er- early in her career, she was a wound care nurse in long term care, and this past experience has committed Kelso to educate other fellow wound nurses on regulations and national standards of wound healing, thereby empowering the bedside nurse with tools and knowledge. And with that, we thank her so much for being here. Martha, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much. It's great coming back, Rob. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to, to, to give you a, a quick shout out because we, as I mentioned at the top of the show, um, we had had you on on episode 118 um, about preventing pressure ulcers in nursing homes. And I have to say, I think that um, the stats are in that that's probably has to be our highest um, rated show. Well, not rated in terms of reviews, but I don't know how to say this in podcast terms, but highest watched sh- um, or downloaded, whatever the, the nomenclature is. But um, you helped make that a fantastic success in terms of viewership and listenership. And I think it's because you really brought the knowledge and shared it with with your audience. So we really appreciate that. And that's one of the main reasons why we wanted to get you back talking about pressure ulcers, because it was such a great mm-hmm. resource for people. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that the education is getting out there, too. I think it's so important that, you know, knowledge is power. And whether you're living with a wound or you have a loved one living with a wound, the more you know, the better off we all are. That's exactly right. Um, and that's kind of where I want to, kind of wh- why I want to focus on this episode, not just because last episode we had you on there, I think we just talked about basic, the basic prevention and interventions with pressure ulcers. But um, I really want to kind of get a little bit deeper into understanding um, development of pressure ulcers and from a, from a basically almost like a health provider, uh, uh, a healthcare professional standpoint of why these particular type of wounds can be a difficult proposition. Um, So for the audience out there, if you want to know the basics of pressure ulcers, what they are, that kind of thing, please be sure to check out that previous episode because we we kind of spend the first five to six minutes talking about that. So if you need a refresher on what type of injury a pressure ulcer is, I would encourage you to do that. So we're going to kind of skip that process and I, I, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about this. But the first question, Martha, that I've, I have for you is 
Um, why is a pressure ulcer m more difficult to diagnose? Like, why is this, you know, it seems like it's intuitive. Well, it's a pressure ulcer, but maybe not. So what, what makes it hard to, to, to know that it's in fact a pressure ulcer? Well, there's no study in the world today that, and when I say study, I mean a test, a diagnostic test that we can order in the world today that proves hands down that a wound is a pressure ulcer. And pressure ulcers mimic so many other wound types. So, for example, if you have an arterial ulcer on your ankle, it looks identical to a pressure ulcer. And that's the challenge. Margolin's ulcers look identical to a pressure ulcer. Margolin's ulcer, I can confirm on biopsy. So there's a test that I can order proving that it is a margolin ulcer. There is not a test that I can order proving that a wound is a pressure ulcer. And so it's why the current national guidelines, national standards state that pressure ulcers are exclusion of other diseases. So you basically, if they, if if there is in um, a, 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 what you suspect is a pressure ulcer, I guess, is it a matter of you want to rule other things out first, and then what's left is that it's likely a pressure ulcer? Is that kind of where we're at, or? Yeah, that's correct. I would add a word. You know, the unless unless you actually saw pressure happen with your own eyes. So if you walk into a room and the heel is sitting on something and you move their heel and there's that indent or you know, the wound is clearly from what the heel was sitting on, that's pressure, hands down. You're not guessing. You, you saw it happen. That makes sense. And, I'm, and I guess that would, that's the, the difference between those type of ulcers would be more of a concern based, uh, if it's on a limb versus, you know, mm -hmm. if you have one on the caustic, the sacrum, that's, I mean, wouldn't that necessarily mean that it would, it's, you're definitely looking at pressure at that point, or is it still, you need to rule no, things out? No, I mean, mm -mm, yeah, and again, great question, but a margolin ulcer, if it's going to occur in the elderly, is going to occur on the caustic or the sacral area. Mm. That makes uh, sense. Radiation necrosis wound um, the further you go out from radiation, so let's say that you had your prostate radiated in the 1980s, the further you go out from the radiation, the greater the chance of skin destruction from the isotopes. So if you've had prostate radiation, it's usually through the sacrum or the coccyx area. So the radiation necrosis would occur in that area. That makes sense. So I guess... Then from a broad standpoint, then can you kind of just talk about the, from a health standpoint or, or a medical standpoint, kind of what the basic differences is, differences are between these different type of ulcers? How, how are these other ulcers developing, if not from pressure? Mm -hmm. So an arterial ulcer develops from lack of blood flow or lack of oxygenation. There's not enough nutrients or oxygen to keep the skin healthy because we're not getting enough perfusion to that area, where pressure is caused from prolonged, intense pressure occurring over that tissue area, the area of tissue or bone, preventing, that pressure is preventing the blood flow from getting to the tissue, so therefore the tissue dies, so we have tissue necrosis. Gotcha. But both of them are from tissue death but it's the cause of the tissue death, death or the underlying etiology that determines how you diagnose the wound. Is it possible to have, um, and you're, you're saying arterial, art, arterial ulcer, is that the same as a vascular ulcer? It, it can be, but you can have vasculitis that's actually an autoimmune disorder. So arterial disease is from atherosclerosis, um, People that have had strokes or heart attacks have known arterial disease throughout their entire body. But you can also have arterial occlusion, like an artery that's occluded, that's also an arterial wound. So sometimes the cause of the arterial disease could be different causes. The cause of the arterial wound could be from different causes. Understood. And so um, that's going to obviously 
determine the course of treatment, knowing the differences between these, these type of ulcers mm -hmm. and the culprits. So, um, and, and whether or not the wound is healable. So if you have a 90% occlusion, say from the popliteal artery down, and they're a surgical candidate, the chances are we can get them out to vascular surgery, get the occlusion opened up, and the wound will go on to heal. But if they're not a surgical candidate, the wound is not going to heal. As a matter of fact, it's, it's going to get worse, and they will probably develop more wounds because of the lack of blood flow, in which case that's a palliative wound or possibly a hospice candidate. Sure. So what was the, what's the, then how, how are you ruling out the arterial ulcer? Like what's the, what's the process mm -hmm. by which you would, you would do that? Mm -hmm. the, the fun thing is we're living in the millennium, right? And so we don't have to do 1980 wound care anymore, which is right. awesome. So we have numerous studies out there that we can order to prove that a wound has arterial disease. So arterial ultrasound would be one of them. The great thing is it's a non-invasive study. So it's rarely, rarely painful. We could do an ankle brachial index, also known as an ABI. We could also do a vascular surgeon and have an arteriogram performed, like an a, a arterial mapping, like potential dye study, showing where the occlusion is and are there other occlusions. But I would say that we have options out there on differential diagnostic studies to order to determine how, if that wound is arterial or not. I, I would say this, I would, I would take, well, my sister would take issue with the fact that we're not living in the eighties. She watches at least two or three episodes of golden girls every, <laughs> oh, yeah. every night. She's got like the laser, not laser disc. That would be the eighties version. She's got like the Blu-ray. That's the word I'm looking for. All the golden girls. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. I digress. No. Um, so, okay. Um, so Martha, then why is it that you think that, um, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but I feel like from the, our last conversation, it was your opinion that oftentimes, well, maybe not oftentimes, but sometimes it's there's a tendency to overdiagnose something as a pressure ulcer. Why, why, mm -hmm, why, right. why is that then? What, what's, what, what makes that the case? I think that we're so um, tuned to the fact that if it's over a bone, it must be pressure. And even as a, a young nurse early in my career, that's what I was taught also. If it's over a bone, you call it pressure, you stage it, you list it as pressure. And so oftentimes we're relying on nurses to diagnose. Nurses are not trained in differential diagnostics. That's why you need physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, but also people that are trained in the current standards of care, the current regulations, and then understanding that pressure ulcers mimic so many other wound types. And so we really want to get to the basics of how do we know what we're treating. Additionally, we also need to recognize that wounds are multifactorial. There are always, almost always, different factors playing into that wound, whether it's nutrition, obesity. You know, I struggle with the word noncompliance, but you hear that a lot. Sometimes what we need to do to get the wound to heal or to prevent from developing new wounds Sometimes our patients are not willing to do that. Okay, that's okay. It's your body. So sometimes we forget that our job is really to outline the option for the patient, and it's the patient's job to choose an option. But I would say more than 60% of the time, there's mixed etiology playing into that wound. They may be arterial and diabetic. They may be diabetic and have venous disease. They may have malnutrition and diabetes. You you mentioned, and this might be a good segue here. You mentioned the word staging in that. Um, in other mm -hmm. words, the, the the ulcer by um, most standards today goes through a process by which it goes from stage one all the way up to stage four, or depending, it could be unstageable. Can you briefly kind of describe the stages of a bed sore, and then kind of talk about um, whether or not that's actually um, an appropriate way to monitor them and to keep track of them? Well, uh, that's a loaded question. It's interesting because there's some current debates going on in the, the national uh, realm of whether or not the staging scale is old and outdated and right. whether it is appropriate to even use a staging scale to currently stage pressure ulcers. Um, the school of thought 
originally, when the pressure ulcer scales were developed, was that wounds developed from the outside in. And we know that's not always the case. Sometimes wounds are developing from the inside out, uh, not related to neglect. Sometimes it is a deep tissue injury that's occurring at the level of the bone because the patient's body is failing and therefore it erodes from the inside out instead of an extrinsic cause or something that happens, you know, laying on laying on an object for too long. That's inside out, of course. And so the other challenge is the staging scale is not the same across the healthcare continuum. So home health nurses have their own staging scale. Hospitals have their own staging scale. Nursing homes have a different staging scale. <laughs> and so it becomes very complex. So if, I can describe the nursing home staging scale, if that's what you would like. Yeah. And kind of, yes. But that is different than the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel staging scale. They're not the same. Just to be clear. Sure. Yeah. Let's so, let's let's kind of go into that a little bit with the nursing home, and then we can talk about the NA, NAPU. Okay. So the in the nursing home, a stage one is an area that does not blanch. And when I say doesn't blanch, what I mean is doesn't blanch after a period of time. And so we talk about, you know, while this, if you got sleepy in the middle of your day and you fell asleep on your desk at work, if you raised yourself up, you would have a line probably on your face from from laying too long. Right. But within 30 minutes to an hour, that line would disappear. That's a normal human phenomenon. That's not a stage one pressure ulcer. That's something that happens to all of us, even when we're children. So stage one pressure ulcer is non-blanchable, and it, it does not blanch after a period of time, 30 minutes to an hour. So there's no break in the skin, which means there's no drainage. It will not have a purple area around it. It will not have bruising around it. It will simply be pink or red that's not blanching or not blanchable caused from pressure. Stage two, then, is partial thickness. Uh, CMS came out with new guidance in long-term care in November of 2017, what's known as the Mega Rule Update. And they very clearly said in a partial thickness wound caused by pressure, you may not have granulation tissue, you may not have fluff, and you may not have as far in the wound. That would be a full thickness. So stage two is is simply where the top layer or two of skin is missing, but it's not deeper than skin deep. Stage three then is full thickness, so it is down into granulation tissue. It's uh, missing the top layer and the second layer of skin, uh, but it's not down into muscle, tendon, bone, ligament. It might have some fluff, but the fluff cannot obscure the the base of the wound, therefore obscuring the true depth of the wound. Hmm. Uh, stage three may have an epiboly, what's known as a rolled edge. In a partial thickness wound, you will not have a rolled edge. Um, in a stage four, then, that's full thickness. It may be down to bone, tendon, muscle, or you may have, you may be able to directly palpate bone, tendon, or muscle. That would also be a stage four. It might have an epiboly, sinus tract, underlining. Um, an unstageable wound is where you cannot see the true depth of the wound. So there's fluff, S bar, something is covering the deepest part of the wound. And, um, and, and then your deep, your deep tissue injury is where there's an injury that occurs at the level of the bone or muscle, very deep, and it may erode or open up but it typically will have a heralding sign. It could be purple around the wound, something like that. One more thought. There's four places on the body where subcutaneous tissue does not exist. Therefore, stage three does not exist. And that's the ankle, the nose, the ear, and then the occiput, the back of the head. Gotcha. And and how does that staging model differ from the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel? Yeah, so National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel issued guidance uh, and did some updates in the most recent years, but because they're an advisory panel, they are not the 
uh, federal government, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. CMS issues um, direction to all of their entities. So long-term care, for example, CMS issued in the REI or the MBS manual that they are CMS and everybody that is coding wounds in long-term care must stage based on the REI manual, not the NQAP staging criteria. So same with long-term acute care hospitals. They must follow the staging criteria set out by CMS, not by NQAP. And so there are differences and nuances based on the definitions and the stage. What? It, I'm sorry, go ahead. Might, I was going to say it might be prudent because there are so many different staging criteria across the continuum. It might be prudent to list those links maybe on your website. I will, uh, yes, I can, yes, go ahead. I can send you the links for those. Absolutely. We'll flash those up on the screen, and I'll put those in the show notes. Um, just email those to me um, a little bit later, and I'll make sure that they get put on. But that okay. actually makes a good question for me is, is what, why do you think that it's so hard to have or so difficult to have uniformity between um, staging models and then between the different types of facilities? Why does acute care need a different model than long-term care? I wish I had the answer for that because it sometimes keeps me up at night. Yeah. <laughs> I find it very frustrating. As, as a, com My company, of course, works across the continuum of care, and so it's very challenging to remember to use different staging, mod uh, different staging criteria based on where you are. So, uh, you know, if I was speaking to a loved one or a relative, what I would say is pay attention to the wound measurements pay attention to the description of the wound because, in my opinion, that's actually more important than the staging. So if we have a wound that has 80% healthy tissue this week and next week 60% healthy tissue, the wound has deteriorated or it's gone backwards. Or if it has 80% healthy tissue this week and 100% healthy tissue next week, now we're cheering. We're moving in the right direction. Because the other challenge is we don't back stage a wound. So once the wound is a stage three, it's always a stage three, even if it's getting better. So oftentimes that terminology is not the first thing I pay attention to. It's, is the drainage better? Is our pain better? Is there odor? You know, is the drainage green or is the drainage clear colored? And so that's what I would say about the staging criteria. The number isn't necessarily the most important thing. It's happening with the wound that's most important. Right, and and wh why why do you think that is? Like, what what's what's the problem in correlating the the number to actually what's going on? Because I mean, we have clients that, obviously that call us and say it's a you know stage three or stage four, and they're upset. And I look, and it's you know it's it doesn't it doesn't look bad, and they recover easily from it. So obviously you know, either it wasn't a stage three or a stage four, or there's an issue with the, with the staging model itself. Like, what, why is there a problem in correlating those two things? Well, I, number one, I think confusion, but number two, the staging criteria is, is somewhat complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, um, we're asking people to stage wounds based on level of tissue destruction but they don't always understand what they're looking at. So very oftentimes a nurse may call something bone when it's in fact a joint capsule. They may refer to something as a tendon when it's actually a ligament. And so nurses, unless if they've been through surgical training and have actually seen some of those structures in real life, sometimes we don't know what we're looking at, but we're expected to call it something. I don't know if that makes sense. Sense. No, it does, and I think that makes sense. On, 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 I guess that's why, in my experience, oftentimes the only descriptions that we get are just the measurements, which um, mm -hmm. you know, because people really don't know what these terms mean: granulated, partial thickness, full thickness. Um, mm -hmm. They, they just are like, okay, uh, this is above my pay grade. I'm just gonna, you know, it's, it's, you know five centimeters by six centimeters by one centimeter and, and I just mm -hmm. let the doctor know. So, And some of the expert cases that I do as expert witness, um, 
I have to tell you, oftentimes doctors and nurse practitioners, even at the hospital, are not listing length, width, and depth. And it's one of the biggest red flags I have because wounds are three-dimensional. Wounds are always length, width, and depth. Correct. Always. Correct. And so I, I often see things mislabeled, misquantified, and not even just from our bedside nurses, sometimes by our doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants. Sometimes uh, even WOCNs, I see things that are mislabeled or misrepresented, misdescribed, and it's a challenge of prospect care. You know, when I went to my LPN and my RN programs, Bob, there was no wound care training in my program. That's amazing. Like, I, I, I mean, w- w- pressure ulcers themselves, at least in my experience, are so common that that would be strange for them to, to have no training in that. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yep, there was no there was no course, and so a lot of a lot of what I've learned over the last twenty seven years in my career has been on the job training. Sure. Or finding finding someone that was willing to be my mentor that really understood it and was willing to put up with my montage of questioning. <laughs> right. Why? 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 You know, and um, healthcare's broken in and of itself, and so we've got to give back to the industry and do educational forums and and teach people ongoing kind of bring them into the fold and say let me show you something i want to teach you about this that makes sense um well this is something that we didn't get into last episode and and again our listeners are generally family members of nursing home residents um we've been Mm -hmm. using the term partial thickness and full thickness can mm-hmm. you can you just basically describe what that means? Because that might be something they see on a chart and they have questions about, um, you know, what's going on with their loved one. Sure. So partial thickness is the top layer or two of skin only, but not deeper than skin deep. So to quantify that, a partial thickness wound, I want people to envision credit card thick or less or dime thick or less. That's the partial thickness. Mm-hmm. Okay. 0.1 centimeters or less. That's all partial thickness. So if everybody kind of looks at the backs of their hands and thinks, man, if I had a wound on the back of my hand that was deeper than credit card thickness, you would already be down into deeper structures, right? Mm -hmm. So more than a credit card, more than dime thick is going to be your full thickness wound, more than 0.1 centimeters. That's full thickness. It simply means we're through the skin down into deeper structures. And so kind of your easy button, surgical wounds are always full thickness, right? You would you don't pay a surgeon to kind of tease the top two layers of skin with your scalpel. Uh, abscess is always full thickness. It's always below the skin, usually into subcute tissue. If you have a biopsy or a skin graft, you know, the a dermatology has removed a cancerous lesion. That's full thickness always, hands down. So those are kind of my two descriptors for the two terms. And the reason why that's the the the, um, the size of the the dime, the thickness of a dime, that's important. Is because that's the that's generally the difference between when you're just going through the first layers of skin to actual tissue, mm-hmm. and that's important because. That's right. It can be mm-hmm. much more dangerous. Can you speak to that with regard to the concept that the wound actually starts from the bottom and moves towards the skin rather than the the opposite? Because yeah, the, several of the, numerous wound types are from internal. They're internal factors. So you think about somebody you make maybe that had blood clots, and the blood clots have shot out throughout the body. That's known as an embolic shower. Well, that's from an inside event working its way outside. Uh, purpura, for example, is another skin symptom or disorder that always works inside out. And so a lot of the injuries that occur to our tissue are from metabolic or medical issues. Even deep tissue injuries can be from medical issues where the um, Kennedy terminal ulcer, for example, is from a medical issue. The body is failing, the organs are failing, we're not perfusing the tissue and the skin with good nutrition, hydration, blood flow, oxygenation. So the tissue death occurs, and because the tissue death is occurring, it starts eroding and eventually works its way out to where we can see it with our eyes. 
Right. So even though we're talking about something that is for coming basically from inside the body, it it's mm -hmm. you know it it starts or we we don't start to notice it until you know it's on the skin essentially. So just because you're Correct. just because you're in that you know partial thickness doesn't mean there's more things going on underneath the surface. Is that kind of like a is that is that fair well, to say? I guess or. Uh, I wouldn't agree with that. Okay. I would say something that has symptoms, uh, what I refer to as a heralding sign, that purplish, um, you've already got a deep tissue. I would refer to that as full thickness because I can, once that purplish color appears, mm -hmm. or it might have a bluish hue to it, it's the body telling you there's damage under here. We just haven't opened up enough for you to see it. So to me, that's a full thickness injury. I already know it's deeper than skin deep. Or partial thickness, uh, you know, if you've ever skinned your knee or gotten a rug burn, that's the top layer or two of skin. Mm -hmm. So that can take, you know, I always think about, you know, riding my bike and skinning my knee from riding my bike. And it, you know, it bled at first and then it converted to a scab and then the scab eventually you know, worked its way off. And in a young, healthy person, that took two to four weeks, even at, you know, the age of seven. And then you think about, well, how long would it take in an elderly person? It can take up to 60 days for a partial thickness wound, like a stage two, to heal. But sometimes I see people mislabel scabs as SCAR. SCAR is full thickness by definition. It has a different chemical makeup than a scab. Right. So that it's just something else to keep in mind. Sometimes we're calling things SCAR when it's really a scab, and sometimes we're calling it scab when it's really SCAR. But scab is partial thickness, SCAR is full thickness. You know, you would think with so many residents, with so many patients, that we would be moving closer to a uniform standard and all these things. Um, mm -hmm. But Martha, yeah. thank you so much. This episode has flown by, and I feel like a lot of the listeners' questions have been answered. And again, you've been an excellent resource. Um, sure. We so much appreciate you coming back on the show. Um, and, and again, thank you so much for your time. Sure. I appreciate you having me back, Rob. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay. We love to have Martha on the program. I would say that after this, after your second time, you're a friend of the program is what I would say. Um, but at any rate, um, again, you can tell Martha is passionate about um, wound care, wound prevention, um, pressure ulcers. She's really good at what she does, and I would really highly recommend everybody check out uh, Wound Care Plus online. Go check them out. Read the website. It's fantastic. has a lot of information on there. Um, but again, I just want to remind everybody that um, Pressure Ulcer Awareness Day is coming up in the month of November. Um, so um, keep that in mind. Put that on your calendar. Celebrate. Um, and again, I guess I, I would I would also say that you want to thank a veteran today. Today is obviously Veterans Day where we um, celebrate the sacrifices and ultimate sacrifices made by um, our military. Um, so I just want to give a shout out there. And um, I also... Uh, November happens to be Alzheimer's Awareness Month as well as National Caregivers Month. So a lot of stuff going on in, in November to celebrate and to be thankful for uh, as well. Um, but at any rate, we appreciate you sticking through this long. Um, again, you can check out new episodes of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast every other week. We are bi-monthly on Monday mornings. Um, like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from or you can watch the podcasts and all of its glory on YouTube or on our website, which is nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. That is nursinghomeabuse.com. And with that, we will see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Nothing said on this podcast, either by the host or the guest, should be construed as legal advice, nor is intended to create an attorney-client relationship between the host or their guest and the listener. New episodes are available every Monday on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or on your favorite podcast app, as well as on YouTube and our website, nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. Again, that's nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. See you next time.